we heard, or at least some of us heard, that the historic statement, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. We heard that. What we didn't hear that Mission Control did was good luck, Mr. Gorski. Mission Control was uh, confused by this, so they looked up to see if uh, Neil Armstrong was dissing the Russian space program, but there was no Gorski in the Russian space program. So when Neil Armstrong got back to Earth, he was asked about this enigmatic statement, good luck, Mr. Gorski, and he said, I can't talk about it. And that's the position he held for the next 20 years. Finally, a reporter ran him down who'd remembered from a tip that he got from someone who'd worked in the space program about this, and he asked him, and Neil Armstrong said, well, I guess I can talk about it now. The Gorskis have passed away. Armstrong said, I grew up in a little town, Wapakoneta, Iowa, and my next door neighbors were the Gorskis. My uh, friend and I were playing baseball one day, and the ball went over the uh, fence and landed underneath the Gorskis bedroom window. I jumped over the fence and I went to pick up the ball and I could hear Mrs. Gorski yelling at Mr. Gorski, sex, you want sex? You're not getting sex till the kid next door walks on the moon. <laughs> so what I'd like to talk to you about today and the theme that will run through this presentation is patience. So cows and fish, what is it? Well, it's not a, a bit of genetic engineering gone wild. It's a non-government organization, a not-for-profit organization. I can assure you it's not for profit. It's about riparian stewardship and management. And it, uh, it's had a, over a 25-year lifespan. Uh, in 1991, when we started this, my colleague Barry Adams and I, we had monochromatic hair. And you can see in 25 years, it's turned into polychromatic hair, hair and uh, digital photography has thickened our waistlines. <laughs> the, uh, the whole purpose of Cows and Fish or the Riparian Habitat Management Society, which doesn't roll off the tongue very well, is really about this fundamental thing, stewardship. And what stewardship means to us and what we deliver in the communities and watershed groups that we work with in Alberta is an amalgam of three fundamental pieces of stewardship. The first is awareness, helping people understand their, their landscape and the place that they make a livelihood from. Uh, ethics, in other words, helping them develop an ethic of stewardship or helping them enhance their current ethic of stewardship. And the last one, which doesn't work the first two don't work unless you do the last one, is action. So just to give you some context, we work in the Boreal Forest Natural Region, the Great Circumpolar Boreal Forest. We work in the Parkland Natural Region, most of which has been cultivated now. We work in the Rocky Mountain Natural Region, mostly uh, public land. We work in the foothills, a combination of public and private land, mostly ranch land. We also work in the montane, again, a combination of public and private land, uh, a strip of land between the foothills and the mountains, not quite mountains, not quite foothills, not quite grassland. And then lastly, we work in the grassland, about 75% of which has been converted to cultivation agriculture. And just to, uh, to add to the enduring myth about Canadian winters, yes, we do have winters in Canada. So what we try to do is help people with stewardship efforts on the land. And one of the things that I've recognized over my career is that when you look at a piece of landscape and how we look at that landscape and how we manage it is actually based on some very simple uh, straightforward things. We, uh, we use a variety of regulations and legislation and policy and planning tools, for example, a bunch of administrative tools to manage that landscape. We may offer subsidies for people to do the right thing. I call it delivering conservation from an automatic teller machine. And we also 
put together and put band-aids on the damaged bits of the landscape, albeit at a postage stamp scale. Now, I'm not suggesting that any of these processes of managing landscapes are wrong, but I think over my career, what I've tended to see is that we jump back and forth in, from one of these strategies to another, hoping that one of them will finally be the silver bullet that will solve our issues in terms of landscape management. I, I think we think that it's going to be magic, and I don't know about you, I love Harry Potter, but I just don't think you can lose 30 pounds in 30 days for $30. And I think that's the issue that we face when we jump back and forth. And when you actually look at the metric for landscape health, and we've been measuring riparian health in Alberta for quite a long time, and what that roll-up of the figures tells us is that about half of the landscapes, the riparian landscapes that we've worked on, are healthy with problems. In other words, there is some impairment of some of the ecological functions within that landscape. Only 25% of those landscapes are healthy where all the ecological functions are being performed, and another 25%, all those ecological functions are either missing or impaired. And so this strikes me as a bunch of big red lights flashing that those ways that we have dealt with landscape management haven't worked well for us, and I suspect it's the same in your jurisdictions. And so Cows and Fish was really an attempt to take this to another plateau, to help people gain another appreciation of a different pathway towards landscape scale management. And it, and it comes down to this. People are faced with an elephant-sized suite of issues. And, of course, you know the old axiom of how you eat an elephant. Well, Lauren's corollary is you eat the soft bits first. So what we try and do is work with a process, or maybe a better way of putting it is a pathway. So the pathway that we help people with starts with awareness. So it's providing people with that basic, that fundamental understanding of ecological structure, function, and process on that landscape that they live on and make a living from. And it's frankly simple stuff. Water runs downhill. Now, if you understand that, then you understand that gravity isn't just a good idea, it's the law. It helps people understand that when we have in the lower corner here, this stream with all its meanders intact, all the vegetation intact, all sorts of opportunities happen to reduce the energy in that system, and that system plods along like an old pickup truck. But of course, we've modified systems. We've grazed the banks, we've cut down the timber on the banks, we've paved the stream banks, we've turned the stream banks into Zeller's parking lots. And of course, the energy that's liberated is phenomenal. Simple bit of physics. Double the speed at which water moves, you increase its ability to erode by four times, and the ability of that system to carry 64 times more material. The same math that the bank uses to calculate the interest on your unpaid visa account and not on your interest bearing savings account. So it tells you that somewhere down the system, if we fail to understand these basic processes, somebody is going to get and going to be the beneficiary of all that extra energy, and it's not going to be good. The other part is helping people understand that there are discrete landscape units out there. We have tended to homogenize our land uses right across the whole specter of land types. And yet, when we think about riparian and aquatic systems, they are much more sensitive to some land uses and we should be more appropriate in how we place those land uses. It, it also starts to help people understand that this thing called riparian it's only 2 to 5% of our landscape in Alberta, but it's demonstrably more important than its small size would indicate, uh, especially from an ecological standpoint. The other thing that I think that we have to grapple with, and in the early years of cows and fish we had to grapple with this more, more quickly, was that people's inclination was to say the landscape has never changed. And of course this is the classic shifting benchmark. So we went back and we found archival photography. So in 1887, that was downtown Calgary, a city that's a million now. On the other side, 100 years later, is what Calgary looks like. Um, on the uh, black and white photo, that was the last time you could find parking in downtown Calgary, by the way. 
The other part of it is that these landscape processes involve an intricate association with vegetation. And the other thing is, is that ecosystem health looks messy. And so with our often European backgrounds, we have this sense that we have to clean up a landscape, that that equals health. Well, what we help people understand is that some of this stuff, like large woody debris, is an integral part of landscape health. Another thing that we try to do is help people understand and anticipate risk. If you don't understand processes, you may run afoul of them. If some of your infrastructure, like a fence or a barn, may float down the creek. It's also about understanding from an agricultural standpoint, because we work primarily, but not exclusively, with farmers and ranchers, is that this piece of the landscape, this green zone, is agriculturally more productive than the whole rest of your farm or ranch. And so it's pragmatic good business to manage this well. Because from a ranch standpoint, this is where tons of, of, of forage per acre is produced compared to pounds per acre in the uplands. So looking after this is part of being a good business person. It's also about we are all part of this. It doesn't matter whether we're a farmer or a rancher or a city dweller, we all have an impact on this little piece of the landscape called riparian. And so that critical filter and buffer that separates everything we do in the uplands from what happens in the aquatic zone and the water quality depends in part on the quality and the health of that riparian area. So one of the questions we ask people is, are you downstream water drinkers? How many of you are? Well, you all are. So then we all own the problem. This is the hotbed of biological diversity. Riparian areas in Alberta contribute to critical habitat for 80% of our fish and wildlife species. So all of the fish and most of the wildlife. And of course, we don't ignore what we've been talking about for the last two and a half days. This is a workshop that is a set aside now where we help people understand how to effectively live with beavers. And we do that again by creating a whole bunch of uh, stories about what beavers do for us. As many speakers have already talked about, the ability of beaver dams to store sediment. And the amount of sediment they store is phenomenal. Each beaver dam, on average, contributes to the storage of sediment that if you were to take tandem dump truck loads full, each beaver dam would contain 382 tandem dump truck loads of sediment. That contributes to water quality amelioration in most of our watersheds. It's also about helping us understand that this is about how we contribute to better flow regimes to, to tweak the hydrologic response in watersheds because beavers store water and systems that have beaver dams on them contribute more water downstream. It's also about understanding that from a perspective of energy, beaver dams are speed bumps in the streams. And so this is a way we start to dissipate some of that energy that's created by our land use activities upstream to deal with bank erosion, to deal with flooding. And so it begins to, to give us the opportunity to start to tell a story about how we adapt to climate change and the double whammy of drought and flood which we all know from Western North America is going to be the, the future for us. And if we don't understand it, it will wave over us anyway. So we provide people information, the, the factual information about climate change. And, and frankly, this is the best proof that we've found so far that climate change is happening. <laughs> So take that to your deniers. <laughs> and, and also, riparian areas are what connect us. We tend to think sometimes that this is a rural problem. Well, it's not. It's a problem that crosses a whole bunch of jurisdictional and administrative lines. And so riparian areas connect us whether we live in an urban center or whether we live in a rural area. How do we do it? Well, Margaret Wheatley said, there's no more powerful way to initiate significant change than to, than to convene a conversation. So if you want to know the secret behind cows and fish, here it is. First time I've told it to anyone. 
we talk to people. I'll repeat that because there's a lot of people in the organization, the provincial government that I used to work for, that couldn't grasp that. We talk to people. We also listen to people. And we talk to people at the rate of, we talk to about 7,000 people a year. That's generally in groups of 20 or less, so that's over 300 interactions, workshops, presentations, and so forth, delivered throughout the province by about six of us at any given time. So that's how you contribute to awareness. The, the next step is, because you have to work at the appropriate scale, and you have to work at the right ecological scale, which is generally a watershed, you have to work at the right social scale, which is the community, you also have to work at the right economic scale. And we're a small organization, so we don't have the resources to interact individually with all the people that have a riparian interest. There's 50,000 farm and ranch families in Alberta. You divide six into six people that deliver the program into 50,000, you can see it's a, it's a long-term prospect. So economically, it more, makes more sense for us to talk to communities because it's about a group. And so oftentimes, the rural communities and sometimes the urban communities that we work with there's no social bonds left in those communities. So we have to rebuild a community so that we can start to interact with a community at the right scale. And, and so it, it comes to this, how many of you drink? This isn't a judgment, by the way. You, you consider that, but you think about your favorite pub. And so you come out of the pub, and here's this guy down on his hands and knees in the parking lot. And you say, Frank, what are you doing? And Frank says, I'm looking for my truck keys. And you say, but, but Frank, the bar is here and your truck's over there. Why are you here? To which Frank replies, I'm here because the light's better. <laughs> well, this is a metaphor that we always look for solutions in the light of our own understanding. And sometimes the the academic hats we wear, the institutional hats we wear, the backgrounds that we have, our interests, put blinders on us. And blinders don't contribute to solving problems. So the thing that we have to do is, is get people to meet one another again, to build those social bonds within the community, and then open doors for the agency staff, staff the technical people, the professional people, the scientists, also the people with some resources to help these communities come in and start that critical interaction because what we understand is that science gives us knowledge. But interacting with people who have been on the landscape two, three, four, five generations gives us knowledge. And so that's a powerful combination when you wed knowledge with that intricate science background. That's what we do. And so, community level work is important because Leopold admonished us, often it is necessary for landowners along a creek to work out a unified plan, else there is danger that the lack of diligence of one owner will result merely in passing the trouble down the creek to his neighbors. So that's why we have to work on a community basis because this riparian zone part of, of the aquatic areas all link us inevitably one to another. The next step is, once people have bonded, once people have to understand that they have an issue, that they want to work on this together, they need tools. And so, for example, in riparian grazing management, we start to help people understand that there's not just one way of looking at grazing of riparian areas. There's a number of ways, depending on your particular operation, the type of riparian area, the type and season of use and so forth. And we bundle that up in terms of our presentations and our awareness materials. All of these are available on our website, by the way, www.cowsandfishalloneword.com. The, the thing that we do with this stuff, gently, is we challenge people. Really, repairing grazing management, it's about outsmarting a cow. Surely we are up to the task. <laughs> no one yet has said, no, I'm not up to it. So, and, and it's the same with our work with living with beavers. 
you know, giving people the options and alternatives. What's in the realm of possible, if you understand what some options are, to live with these critter, critters that can sometimes be pretty pesky. So we use a variety of things to help people. Demonstration sites being one. Uh, on your, that would be this side, is a stream that looked like that for about 15 miles. Now, the grazing association we worked with recognized that they had a problem on their hands. They recognized that sooner than later, somebody was gonna point the finger at them. And so we worked with them on some relatively simple changes in riparian grazing management, and the result is shown on the other side. Now, this is not back to health yet, but the trajectory now is positive. And the point that I think we have to make with people is that, for example, in my landscape, these landscapes, because of a variety of land uses, cattle grazing included, fell apart over the last hundred years. We are not going to turn them around tomorrow. But we need to start the, the health trend on a positive note so that in the next decade or more, there's the possibility of a return to higher planes of health. We use a variety of methods to get people on side. One is economic. My colleague Barry Adams is, uh, is standing here looking predictably glum because that pasture, that riparian pasture, is only producing pounds per acre of forage on an annual basis. Over here, no soil type difference, no, no moisture difference, just changes in riparian grazing management. So now that place is producing tons of forage per acre per year. This helps people understand because ranchers can convert grass into red meat and red meat into dollars. And this helps them understand that pragmatically, it's good to manage these areas and manage these areas well because this is where most of my livelihood comes from. We help people understand as well that biodiversity and land uses like livestock grazing, grazing are not mutually exclusive. You can have both, but you need to understand the key drivers in the system so that you can have both of those things happening. And of course, that's part and parcel of the story about beaver, that we can have these things, but we have to recognize what the landscape will support. And so we use another variety of tools. One is a metric of landscape health called riparian health. And so over on this side, here is a system that, uh, you know, consider yourself a trout fisherman or a bird watcher or a camper. I think you would say that's a lovely place to spend time. Over here, maybe not so much, unless you're from an urban center and then it looks like an urban park. But this is health, this isn't. So we've devised a metric that helps people distinguish riparian health from lack of and it becomes a way of using ecological functions and processes to define riparian health. And so doing, not only create a benchmark from which we can measure into the future as management changes happen, but it's also creating, and this is fundamental, a common language. So that instead of arguing over what we see and whose values trump whose other values, we have the same language, and so if something is broken, instead of arguing over whether or not it's broken, we can put all that emotional energy into how do we fix it. So this agency person and these ranchers can identify what the issues are and talk about management changes instead of arguing about whether or not it's broken. Now the next step is community-based action because really, the community owns the problem, they also own the solution. And in fact, this is the delicate dance that we have to do to disentangle ourselves now and give them the opportunity to move forward with solutions that they've come up with based on the help that we've provided them. Now, it comes down to this though. One of the things that I recognized pretty early in my career was that I, as a fish and wildlife biologist, I didn't manage fish. I didn't manage wildlife, I didn't manage water quality, I didn't manage landscape integrity. People like this do. And the sooner that we can help them, 
to give them a better and more fundamental understanding of landscape ecology and how to fit their land use activities in, the sooner we'll have this magic thing called stewardship. And so I think an admonishment to you is that for myself, at a certain point in my career, I stopped counting things and I started to concentrate on what really counts. And that's helping these people changing attitudes and inevitably changing behaviors. So it comes down to this, one family in one watershed, maybe they've got a little bunch of problems that they want to fix, but they become the catalyst for a community to form around them. This is actually Hilton Ferris and his family. The Cows and Fish program was actually started, spawned, no pun intended, around their kitchen table. They became the drivers in their community to start a process of understanding they had problems. They lived in a, in a place called Willow Valley that had precious little willow left because of about 100 years of, of winter grazing by livestock. It's this. It's doing lots of this. So again, another admonishment to you from a lesson that we've learned is you got to do a lot of talking to people until you're sick and tired of the sound of your own voice. But inevitably, what will happen is that people will start recognizing, as this family has, that they have liabilities on their landscape, generally in riparian areas. They also have opportunities because of poor livestock distribution, and if they can shift that balance, they can get back to a higher plane of health. And some of the solutions are kind of remarkable. These, uh, these couple of guys over here, the, uh, the fabric, the social fabric in the community had fallen apart, and there hadn't been a social event in that community probably for the last 20 years. So no opportunity for people to meet and greet and eat together, break bread, and so forth. We helped build that social fabric in the community to the point now that they now start to meet on a regular basis. These guys were neighbors. They had a common fence line. They rarely talked with one another because there was no venue available to do so. Once that venue was available to do so, they discovered they had a similar problem in terms of, in terms of livestock water, and then they contributed and developed an upstream water tank that serves both their pastures. In microcosm, this is how stewardship works. It's getting people to the point where they start to realize the opportunities that, that they have, how they work with their neighbors on these things, and just getting on with it. So the last, although this is a circular pathway that continues to spin wildly out of control, is monitoring. And it really is getting to these four questions. The four questions that we should ask ourselves every time we do something. Where are we? Where do we want to be? How will we get there? And of course, the thing that we run out of money and enthusiasm for is, did we make it? or are we making it? So the question that you should ask me right now is this all sounds wonderful, but does it work? Well, about 12 years into our program, we had an independent evaluation of the program done because we wanted to know, are we affecting a change on the landscape? Is stewardship happening? Are positive management changes happening as a consequence of what we do? So these are just a short form of some of the results. Bottom line, 58% of the respondents made a management change because of an interaction with us. Now, the more important way of parsing out this information is we compared other landowners, that is landowners that did not become part of a watershed group, to watershed group respondents. And when you look at watershed res group respondents, 64% of them made a management change because of involvement with us. And I also want to point out that we don't provide subsidies. We don't provide cash incentives for people to make management changes. Often we will create a pathway to granting agencies who do have cash, but the respondents in this survey said that less than 5% of them made a management change 
because we found a pathway to some money. So they need their management changes for a variety of other reasons. Now, it could have been pragmatic economic reasoning. It could have been regulatory relief. It could have been because they were part of a community and they started to realize that we have upstream neighbors and we have downstream neighbors. And we often are downstream from our upstream neighbors. And so it's just good business and good stewardship to start to improve things for our neighbors and ourselves. One of the other things, and this is a point that I want to drive home because in my view, based on my scar tissue, only two things work in conservation, continuity and persistence. And so what we've done, and we found this out through the survey, is that the, the rate at which people make a management change or the degree to which they make a management change is based on the frequency of contact with them. So minimum contact nets minimum results in terms of a stewardship action. Maximum contact nets a high degree of stewardship action, up to 91%. And so it, it tells you that even though people take a message and they go home, we need to keep in contact. It's about building a relationship with people. And that's fundamental to getting stewardship to happen. The other thing we learned is that from the time we start talking to someone to the time they make their first positive management change is somewhere in the range of three to five years. But if we're not there continually motivating them, providing them additional information in that three to five years, the chances are that they will drop out of the system and not make a management change. So persistence and continuity. So it's not only what you do, does it count? And so the fellow pointing here, John, he was in one of the first riparian workshops that we gave in one of the first rural communities that we talked at. And right in the middle of my presentation on Riparian 101, John stood up and said in a very loud voice, this is BS, and he didn't use the acronym. You can imagine the chilling effect that has on the speaker. He stomped out of the room. So obviously something I had said had got under and was a burr in John's saddle. Silence developed. The rest of the community members said, we don't know what's the matter with John, but you know, continue on, which we did. A year later, we were invited back to that community to give them a workshop on riparian health, to help them understand what these these things are the metrics that go into measuring health of a landscape. John was in the audience, and I waited for the next explosion, and it didn't come. And at the end of the workshop, he took one of us aside and he said, I've been thinking. It took him a year. He said, I've been thinking. He said, I now understand some of the issues that I have on the creek that goes through my ranch. Within the year, John had stepped up to the plate and built two demonstration sites himself, and we had helped find some funding for him to build two more. And so now, a few years down the road, here we are with the community group. John is pointing out what he's done. And what he's telling the audience, and I'm not, I'm not gonna sugarcoat this, he's saying, quit your bitching, get on with it. Now, if I were to say that, you can imagine the reaction. So what we've done is we've created in the community a riparian missionary. And that's another part and parcel that we didn't realize had to be done. Why would we do all this? Well, because water quality counts. You tinker with people's drinking water and the repercussions are going to be quick and you don't know what the impact is going to be. So dealing with water quality issues now and quickly is pragmatic business. What, uh, what does it look like? Well, this is actually a stream in a drought situation. Now, it doesn't have water in the channel right now, but take my word for it, based on our metric, this is a healthy riparian area. You've got vegetation dealing with bank erosion, you've got the opportunity to slow water down, you've got the opportunity for biodiversity to, uh, to be met. 
and you have an opportunity for livestock grazing and livestock shelter to happen. Unlike this street. Now, the only thing that separates these two pictures is a three-strand barbed wire fence. And so, really, the challenge that we've got sometimes is to get people to look through three strands of barbed wire and see what the range of options and alternatives are for them to change their management and get much better performance from the landscape. Does it happen over time? You bet it takes a long time. As a fisheries biologist, I surveyed eastern slope trout streams for the first decade of my career. This stream I surveyed in 1976, and it was a hurting looking unit. The willows were just about going to wink out of shape. Bare ground was prevalent. Uh, Canada thistle was the most predominant vegetation type. Ten years later, not much had changed except that the willows were just about winked out. But this was in the watershed that Hilton Ferris and his family lived at the headwaters. And Hilton became a riparian missionary. He talked to the neighbors. We spent a long time in workshops working with the neighbors. And the neighbor started to realize he didn't need to see this progression happen any further. So he made some management changes. Now, again, the site isn't back to health, but it's on a positive trajectory. And that's what we've got to think about. This is triage for landscapes. So I just want to end quickly because I know this has uh, been a long sip and you want to get on with a bunch of things and I need to start driving back to Alberta. So I'm going to end this with a bit of a motivational thing on how things really work. And here's 10 thoughts about how things really work. And this is directed in large part at each and every one of you. If you don't do anything, nothing happens. So sitting and moaning and whining about it won't net us any better landscape health. Without motivation, most people continue to do nothing. So you need to motivate people in a variety of ways. Our choice has been to, to help them with awareness, to help them understand how their landscape functions. There's never enough time to do anything until you realize it's time to do something. So start the pathway with something to be done. With a little motivation, a few people do something. It might be dangerous, but nonetheless, it's starting that pathway towards getting people moving towards another trajectory. Where's the best place to start? Somewhere. Just get people moving. Even if it's in the wrong direction, because motion is easy enough to change, but stasis is hard to get going. And until you start something, you aren't going to know what works. Once a community realizes that something needs to be done, then many things start to happen. And that's the magic behind working with groups. Now, in spite of evidence to the contrary, a few people persist in thinking that nothing needs to be done. Let the community deal with them. Because you will waste most of your time and energy trying to convince the 10% that they need to change, and you will waste the opportunity to spend time with the other 90%. Now, those that want to do nothing can find enough uncertainty to avoid doing anything. And the caption says, I'll tell you what this means, Norm. No size restrictions and screw the limit. So there will always be detractors. Provide good information to the community, get the community on side, and the detractors will fall by the wayside. And lastly, if you do nothing long enough, soon you'll reach a point where nothing can be done. And in riparian areas, this is prevalent. If you lose the basic building blocks of riparian health, it's hard to get back stability of the system, and particularly, it's hard to get back the opportunity to reincorporate beaver as part of the ecological function of that 
of that system, like wood disappearing from the system as an example. And so, again, no biologist worth his salt would, uh, would leave a presentation without an Aldo Leopold quote, and I think this is the most relevant one in all my readings of Leopold. He said, the real substance of conservation, and I think he was talking about stewardship, lies not in the physical projects of government, but in the mental processes of citizens. All the acts of government, in short, are of slight importance to conservation, except as they affect the acts and thoughts of citizens. So what Leopold is admonishing here is help people change their attitudes, because with attitude shifts come shifts in beliefs, and with belief shifts come changes in actions. And so with that, and I, I, thank, uh, I thank Heidi for uh, coercing me into coming. I thank Leonard for giving me a place on the podium. Um, I had the opportunity to meet some of my conservation heroes like Kent, and I met a whole bunch of new conservation heroes in my time here. So thank you very much.